Well, welcome. We have Tom Rath with us uh, on the line. So welcome, Tom. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be talking with you. Well, thank you. We're here to talk about Tom's latest book that's coming out very, very shortly, Life's Great Question. Tom, you've been studying what makes people successful, engaged, and happy at work for decades. So this book is about how all of us can reorient our efforts towards making the most substantive contribution possible over a lifetime. It's really a book about a whole new way to think about our life's work. Why was this book so important for you to write? You know, there there are two parts to, I guess, my response to that question. And um, one is that at a kind of broad societal level, I, I think we need to build much better and stronger and very different relationships with our work than what most people have on average today. I think most work is actually bad for our health and well-being on average, and it can be a huge catalyst for having better health and well-being and creating a lot more meaning in society. So I think there's a big mismatch there at a kind of macroeconomic level that we can talk about more. But what really got me started on this book in particular was uh, a little bit more of a personal background where I, some readers who have been familiar with my work in the past may know this, but when I was 16 years old, I was diagnosed with a very rare genetic disorder that essentially uh, shuts off one of the body's most powerful tumor suppressing genes. And as a product of that, since I was about 16 years old, I've battled cancer in my eye and my kidneys, my pancreas, most recently in my spine, that's been the most difficult. And as a product of that, uh, Doctors told me when I was 16, they thought I might live to 35 or 40 roughly. And so um, I've essentially spent the last 25 plus years trying to build as much life as I could into what time I thought I had left. And a part of that journey was the realization that, you know, I may not get to be around forever, none of us do, but the things that I contribute to the growth and development of even one other person do get to live on. So in recent years, what I've realized is that, I mean, there's, we spend so much time on ourselves and personality and the like, but in the end, life's really a lot more about what you put into it, not what you get out of it. And so I've been trying to find ways, real practical steps that anyone can take to kind of build their lives and careers around contribution instead of looking inward as much as we often do. Yeah, that. That's wonderful. And, you know, I, I think you mentioned this in the book, too, that when we're facing our mortality, we tend to turn to things that are more meaningful for us, things that have greater purpose. So, so can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's, I think what happens is, then there's been some good work done on this, where even when teens face real extreme life circumstances, life-threatening challenges and the like, they're more likely to emerge stronger and gain resilience. And, um, you know, one of the things I learned when I was young and dealing with a big challenge like that is it, a lot of it is really the product of what other people have invested in relationships with us and what we invest in our relationships with our closest friends and family members, because that essentially creates a buffer where when you do face these big challenges in life, it's a lot easier to work your way through it and sometimes even come out of it a little bit stronger where you have a clearer focus on how you want to make a difference in the world and not just work through all the stuff flying at you in a given day, which is frankly a lot easier with everything uh, there is to distract us today. Yeah. Now, another thing you say in your book, while your talents are nature's best building blocks, they serve the world best when your efforts are directed outward, not inward. Can you tell us more about how we are hardwired to be other directed or, or pro-social? Yeah, and you know, I think a part of the challenge that I see in the modern workplace and also in the self-development field and in the literature and books and so forth, and I've been a part of this, um, is that it's there's a natural inclination to look inward 
when we think about growth and development. And so a lot of it is, I mean, obviously a lot of people have done good work on how do you learn more about your personality? There's quite a bit of conversation about how can people follow their passions and find their purpose. And while all of those can be helpful inputs in a big journey, I'm not sure that those are the right places to start because if I'm anchoring my efforts around pursuing my passion, that essentially assumes that me and my the things I'm passionate about are at the center of a universe and everything else should kind of circle around and fall in line with that, right? And in reality, what happens when most of us enter the work world is we need to figure out how we can leverage our unique talents and what we enjoy doing and how we want to contribute with the big needs of the world and the job market and what people get paid to do out there today. And so what I've learned as a part of my most recent research and the process of working on this book and website is that starting with where you can make the greatest contribution may be a better anchor than beginning with your own personality and passion in mind. Right. Because then you're really of service to the world. Exactly. So I, I know a lot of people who are, are not happy because they don't really feel a sense of purpose or, or meaning at work. And they feel like they have to quit their jobs, completely change their career, go in a new direction. But you have lots of suggestions of how people could make that shift in their current role. Can you share some of those ideas with us? Sure. And I think it's, you know, it's important to know one of my uh, really good friends in past years and mentors was a, a guy named Shane Lopez, who was one of the uh, kind of world's leading experts on hope. And uh, just, he passed away a couple of years ago, but right before he passed away, he was working on a book uh, and shared some ideas with me about it. And he said, uh, he summarized it by saying, great jobs are made, not found. Mm -hmm. And it, and he was describing a lot of the uh, great research from uh, Jane Dutton and Amy Brzezinski and uh, some of the group at the Ross School of Michigan and the like about um, essentially crafting the job you have into one that you love. And I think there's so much work that a lot of us need to continue to do there because as you mentioned, we have a disposition to say, I'm, I'm not happy in this job. I just need a whole new job, a whole new organization. Maybe I even need to move, whatever. When in reality, in many cases, we don't give our current jobs or our current companies the time and effort to see if it can be something much greater than what we'd originally imagined. And, you know, the most common mistake I see is people walk into a job and kind of take this, well, what does the company need from me approach? And they end up looking at what other people do in the same role who have the same expectations or outcome, and they think that they need to do it the same way. When in reality, most organizations and most line level managers that I've spent time with, they would love for their people to find individualized ways, maybe with different hours, maybe with different techniques, maybe with different processes, almost always with a different attitude and a different personality to achieve the same outcome metrics. And if one person who's new to a job can get something done in an entirely different way or with different hours or with different technique, more power to them. And so I think one thing is to try and individualize how you do your job to the outcomes. Another thing is to step back and say at least once a day, how can you connect your efforts with the meaningful contribution it makes to at least one other person. If you're in food service, can you watch somebody enjoying a meal and smiling or telling someone they like the food you prepared? Because that motivates you to keep moving. And um, I, I don't think we do anywhere near enough of that in the modern workplace today. And we need to create kind of self-fulfilling feedback loops so we can see the positive influence of our job. You know, I one of the reasons I wrote this most recent book, I was just continually inspired by one of my favorite lines from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And I've, you know, it may sound like a big, broad existential question, but I've tried to ask myself that question almost every day for the last few years. And I think that question in itself 
is a great way to anchor your work each morning to say, what are you going to do for others today? And when you begin with that important work, you find that it pushes a lot of the things that are urgent, but not really important to the side burner. And I mean, in reality, if I invest an hour or two in my daughter's development and growth this evening, that will count. It will matter and it will continue to grow on. If I get to inbox zero, nobody will even remember a week from now or care. Right, right, exactly. I love that. So just to be able to ask that simple question, can it, it can be just as, as easy as that. I love that. And it anchors things outward. I mean, I think a lot of what I've learned from some of the best research in positive psychology and behavioral economics and the like is the more you can anchor your energy, your efforts, and your work outward toward the influence they have on other people, the better you feel about it, the more you can do for others, and the less the less self-focused and self-absorbed. And, you know, it's also just, it's nowhere near as stressful when you anchor your day around what you're doing for other people instead of worrying about your own neuroses and needs like a lot of us do. I agree. I, I completely agree. Now, what I'm really excited about is that this is not just a book. There's a whole new system that you're introducing. There's an online inventory. There's a ton of resources for people who want to get deeper on knowing about their unique contributing style. And it's called contribify.com. Can you tell us most, sorry, can you tell us a little bit more about the inventory and about some of the resources? I'm sure that our audience would love to know more about that. Yeah, my my broader aim with this project, and the book is just one piece of that, one of three or four pieces of the project, is to help people start a bigger conversation around contribution in their teams, in their families, in their workplaces, with people they coach and the like. And uh, to that end, with each copy of the book, we've included a couple of codes for people to go in and uh, go through this Contribify inventory and profile as many times as they'd like each time they join a new team, when they start a new job, whatever it might be. And the purpose of that is to give people kind of a, a one-page baseball card or profile that is a much more human and personal version of who they are to share with another person than a resume or a LinkedIn profile or a job description, which when I stepped back with a group of leaders a couple of years ago, I mean, you couldn't invent something more sterile and impersonal and clinical than a typical resume if you tried to. So I, I think we've got to try and build systems that bring the humanity back into the work. So mm -hmm. that inventory asks people about what are the big roles they play in life. So for me, that's being a dad, it's being a husband, and then research and writing are the next priorities. And um, it asks each person about their most influential life experiences or their miles, as we call it. Um, so both positive and negative, what are the experiences you've been through that have really shaped you? And boy, do those serve as good discussion points when you're joining a new team and you can get to know each other quickly around that. And then we ask people about how they would describe their strengths best in three words. And then they go through, each person goes through a series of questions about 50 questions that help them to prioritize how they want to contribute to a given team. So the purpose of that is to be used as a tool for groups to say, if we're all gathering together to work on a given product or service or whatever it might be, how do we make sure that our efforts are complementing one another and we have clear expectations about how each of us wants to pitch in so we can be more effective for other people? Well, I really liked my profile when I got in and, and I thought it was hugely helpful and I think it reminded me about why I do the work I do, but it allowed me a much deeper understanding of the real fulfillment that I get from my work and, the, and that, as you say, some of these greater questions can really anchor you in your day. So I, I was really grateful and when I take a look at my miles, I can see those pivotal moments, those truly life-changing experiences and how they've shaped what I'm doing today. So I think it's going to be a great tool for people to use and a great tool for, for organizations to use. And one of the things that you said in the book is that, in fact, uh, research has shown that many organizations are in fact demonstrably bad for your health and well-being. <laughs> so 
I, I think this is going to be a, a great way that organizations can can shift that and and can contribute more to people's well-being. I, I hope it is. And I also would, one caveat I would add is, you know, I've spent the last five, 10 years of my career trying to get organizations as big entities to invest more and to care about their workers' well-being, essentially. And it's because of all the short-term metrics and tasks that organizations are held accountable for, it's a very difficult uphill climb at a company-wide level. And some of the problem, at least in the, in the States, it's tied to a lot of the health and wellness programs are a part of benefit systems and insurance carriers and the like, but it's been difficult to get that conversation elevated to the level of employee engagement, employee experience and the like. So I think one challenge for each of us as individuals and as workers in the economy, in addition to being leaders, is that we need to take responsibility ourselves for saying, once you've found a job that can pay the bills and put shelter over your head and pay for food and the like, it's, I think each of us needs to take responsibility and say, I need to make sure that my work is good for my well-being. I'm a better family member because of it. I'm a better friend because of it. And that it's doing something that makes a positive contribution to society. And no one's going to have all of that as soon as they enter the work world. But over time, I think you can kind of string the arc of a career so that you have more and more of that at an individual level. I love that. That's great. Well, Tom, thank you so much. It has been, has been wonderful to have you on the call. We are your biggest fans here in Canada at the Canadian Positive Psychology Association. And I have been one of your biggest fans for years and years and years. And I, I am so grateful for all the many times that you have supported my work and our work here in Canada. And so thank you. We wish you all the best with the, the launch and, and the book. And we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you so much for all you do. And uh, it was wonderful talking with you today. Thanks, Tom. Have a great day. Thanks so much.